Good morning. Welcome to today's online service from Houghton and Kingmore Parish near Carlisle. My name is Robert Gardner and normally I'm part of the St Peter's congregation. It's good that you've been able to join us, whether as a regular or someone who has just looked in occasionally or you're here for the first time. We're going to continue our studies in the early chapters of Mark's Gospel as the Bible is read and as Andrew, our vicar, preaches later. In today's section, we see Jesus' compassion for his disciples as he invites them to come to a quiet place and spend time with him. And we also see his compassion for a great crowd, people described as sheep without a shepherd, to care for them. The writer of Psalm 103 picks up these ideas. He writes, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. He knows how we are formed. He remembers we are dust. So we meet together to spend time listening to Jesus, knowing that he has compassion. He wants us with him and he has no illusions about what we are really like. So let's begin with a prayer. Father, thank you that in the Lord Jesus we see your character, your compassion, your desire for your children to draw near to you. You know all about us. You know our needs. You know our distractions. You know our waywardness, yet you love us. Please therefore draw us to yourself. Captivate our hearts afresh. Renew our minds with truth and enable us to surrender our wills more fully to you. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our first song contains these words about God our Father. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. To God be the glory.
Great, so we've got the next part of the creed that we're learning and we're going to find out what the kids think about it and see if we've got some good ideas. So it says, on the third day, Christ rose again. Let's go and find out what they think. Hey kids, wake up, wake up. Exciting news, we're learning the next part of the creed. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Our line is, on the third day, Christ rose from the dead. Oh! Whoa, whoa, what's happened? It, we've done it so many times before, some people find it boring. Some people think it's just a silly story from 2,000 years ago. What difference does it make? Brilliant. Well, let's find out if Dad's got any good ideas to answer those questions. Oh, oh, hey John, <laughs> what's up with you? And why do we still do the resurrection when some people find it boring? Great question. Should we take it to the Bible? That's why we take all our questions, isn't it? And the best part of the Bible for resurrection questions is 1 Corinthians 15. And it says here, Paul says, what I was taught, I gave to you, I passed on as first importance. And can you see that he says Christ died and Christ was raised. So the reason that in our church we're always teaching the cross, that Jesus died for our sins, and we're always teaching the resurrection, is because Paul says they're very, very important, of first importance. They're some of the most important things Christians believe. That's why we keep on talking about them. Thank you, Daddy. Oh, <laughs> hello, little one. How are you doing? How do we still believe that he died for us when some people think it's not true? That's a great question because it happened 2,000 years ago and 2,000 miles away. How can we be sure? Well, again, I was just saying to Jonathan. 1 Corinthians 15 helps us with that as well, because look, it says a list of people he appeared to. He appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then the 12, that's the disciples, and then 500 other people. So Jesus appeared indoors and outdoors, town and country, day and night, to one person, 12 people, 500 people. That's not how imaginations work, is it? He was seen and he was touched and he changed lives. And you know the really amazing thing? is that although sometimes, really sadly, people do die for things they think are true but aren't, these people were willing to die for something. They died because they taught that Jesus came back to life. Now, who would die for a lie? And that's how you and I know it's not just a story, but it must be true. Thanks. This time I'm definitely getting some sleep. Oh. <laughs> hey, Josh, what can I do for you? What difference does it make today? What difference does it make? Great question. Well, do you reckon, I have a look down here, we're still in 1 Corinthians 15. Can you see here, it's something we sing at church, isn't it? Where, O oh, grave, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The resurrection being true means we've got real hope that we'll get the resurrection bodies one day in the new creation, just like Jesus' resurrection body. But also, it says at the end, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because it's not pointless. So everything we do for Jesus is not pointless, all because of the resurrection. And by the way, it says at the beginning, in verse 14, 15, if it's not true, then we're just liars. So it's true, and it gives us hope for the future, and it gives us confidence as we work hard now. Can you leave Daddy to do some really hard work in his chair now? Fine. Thanks, love. So Father, please help us to remember that the resurrection is really true, that it's not boring, and it makes a huge difference in our lives today. Amen. As we come to church family news, just a few things to make sure we're all aware of. And the first, the key one, I think, is the great news that as PCC met earlier this week, uh, we've started, uh, we've decided to reinitiate the search for an associate minister to come and serve in the parish. You might remember early in the year, in God's great kindness, we had the money either given or, or promised towards that. And so we're now going to look to restart that process. Uh, we would love to be able to interview in late September so that after a three month um, moving period, it's possible we might have an associate minister in place in January. That'd be thrilling, wouldn't it? So please do restart uh, or continue your praying into that. 
this is a very significant moment for our parish life and ministry. And uh, we're confident that under God, uh, with the appointment of a new minister, uh, we'll see growth. That's what Jesus says. He says, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers because the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. So please do put that back on your prayer list if it's fallen off. And please do pray into the financial implications of that. Uh, we don't run um, with a huge surplus as a parish. Uh, we're always pretty close to the line. And God kindly provides, and he provides through you and me, uh, faithfully uh, and sacrificially keeping on giving. Uh, it might help you to know that giving's been down for various reasons through lockdown. It's quite understandable because many choose to give in cash and so on. But these things do all have implications. So in faith and in hope and in confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ, the PCC has decided to reinitiate this. It'd be thrilling if this could happen under God before the end of this calendar year. Uh, but please do put that back on your prayer lists and please do keep praying about your giving as you give to support the work of the parish, to love Christ and to make him known. Other things very briefly is to let you know for your encouragement that our impact, that's our 11 to 16 year olds, had a great time last weekend. They would normally be at Knock, uh, but they had Knock Down this year all online, had a fantastic time. So a big well done to all the team that worked hard on that. And it's great to know that our teenagers are meeting together and encouraging each other and asking really good questions about Jesus and Christianity and all sorts of things. So it's thrilling that ministry goes on even when church buildings can't be opened. Just a reminder that the church office will be soon shutting down for the summer. So if you've got any questions about what's going on through August, uh, this week is the time to pick up the phone or to drop the email. So the church office will be open this coming week, the week beginning Monday the 20th. But the church office will be shut for the summer on Friday the 24th. So to be, be in touch if you've got any questions about that summer break. And then finally, just a reminder that not this coming week, but the week after, the Keswick Convention is online for one week only, the week beginning the 27th of July. So you can attend the Keswick Convention on your television or on your laptop. You'll see the main morning talks at 10 a.m., for example, youth and children's work and so on at 11. And all the details are on the Keswick Convention website. And again, we've put them up on our Facebook page and so on, so you can find them out there. But what a great thing to do, to look at that week from the 27th of July and put a great big line through it and say, one hour a day, I'm just going to sit and feast on the hope that God gives us through the Psalms as Christopher Ash, one of the great Keswick teachers, opens up the Bible for us. So do get that in your diaries. We're going to carry on now with our service. The compassion of the Father and the Lord Jesus goes all the way to making it possible for us to be forgiven our sins. All those ways in which we fail to meet God's perfection, ways in which we have offended him. The psalm writer has these words, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and see whether there is any wicked way in me. Let's spend a moment reflecting on our need for forgiveness of our sins. Let's think back over the past few days, perhaps even over the past few hours. And as we allow God to search us, we come with the confidence that he longs to forgive us. So let's pray together using the words which are on the screen. O oh Lord our God, you know us better than we know ourselves. As we come before you now, we all share a deep need for we are all lost without your grace. Search us, O God, and know our hearts. Test us and know our troubled thoughts. Give us true repentance. Forgive us all our wrongs. Transform us by your Spirit to live for you each day, to love and serve each other, and through the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord, to come at last to heaven. Amen. Psalm 103, with which we began our service, also has this. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Father, for this we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our next song is based on another psalm, Psalm 23. 
so let's either join in with the music or listen as is most comfortable for us. The Lord's my shepherd. just sung words about the Lord being our shepherd. We will focus our pray, prayers today about verses which talk about the shepherd's care. The Lord Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Our Father, we thank you so much for the great love of the Lord Jesus, who cares for us and has provided for us the one thing we need above all else. He took the punishment we deserve by dying for us and through that gracious sacrifice we can come to you, call you Father and bring our concerns, share our joys and talk with you about all this is on our hearts. May we value this invitation knowing you hear and answer our prayers for our good and for your glory. In today's reading we read Jesus had compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd, so he began teaching them many things. Our Father, thank you that you did not leave us to guess what you are like, but have provided your word, the Bible, where we can learn more about you. We thank you for those who teach us so faithfully in our church, including those who teach our children and young people. May we all listen well to you and your word. May we seek to obey what you say. Help us to encourage each other to grow in our knowledge and trust in you. Amen. 
Jesus said, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. Our Father, we pray that you will open our eyes to see the needs of people scattered throughout the world. As a church, we support work abroad, including OM, remembering the work in South Africa which Peter Nicol leads. We also remember Ugo and Techi Vergara serving you in northern Argentina, working in struggling churches. Jesus had compassion on people, which often meant he brought physical relief too. So we pray for organisations bringing relief to many living in areas of special hardship. We pray for those ministering in refugee camps. We pray for those supporting Christians who are being persecuted for their faith. Jesus wants to bring people from all over the world into his fold. May many hear the good news of Jesus and come to him. Amen. In Revelation we read, For the Lamb at the centre of the throne will be their shepherd. He would lead them to springs of living water. Our Father, many today are struggling with sadness and anxiety, some are living in vulnerable situations. Some are coping with financial cares. May they know your comfort and your wisdom. May we all trust you to be with us in all circumstances, knowing that you really do have everything under your control. Help us to support and encourage one another in word and action as we have opportunity. And please refresh us with your living water today. And we also ask all these prayers in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And we will end this time of prayer using the Lord's Prayer, which will be on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Today's reading is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 30 to 44. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place, place. but many who saw them leaving recognised them and ran on foot from all the towns and got their head of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large ground, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, so he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked, go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. They sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Let's pray again together. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you that the unfolding of your word gives light. And we pray now that I will teach faithfully 
and that all of us will hear that for your truth, that the light of your Bible will shine into our hearts and minds and lives, because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 6 is a contrast between two different kings. You've got King Herod and you've got King Jesus. And that's the big idea. You've got two kings, two feasts. One is a grotty feast and a king who's out of control. And the other is a beautiful feast with a king who's totally in control. And we've got used to the way that Mark uh, works these things out for us and makes them very clear. You might have spotted it as you read ahead for this week. Uh, Jesus sends out the 12, middle of verse 6, all the way down to verse 13. Uh, verse 12, they went out and preached that people should repent. Then you get the account of John the Baptist, verse 14, through to verse 29, verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him, all that they had done and taught. So we can see that there's another Mark sandwich going on here. These, they're sent out, verse 12. They come back, verse 30. And in the middle of that, you get John the Baptist. So clearly the John the, ba the, John the Baptist and Herod uh, story, the account of that feast, that king, um, is put together with uh, what happens with Jesus giving a feast after the report of the apostles having been sent out. So clearly we're meant to read these two together. Two kings, two feasts, one's awful, one's gorgeous. And there's gonna be one warning and one encouragement for all of us as we go through. So let's have a look. First of all, king number one, that is King Herod. And you see that there from verses 14 all the way through to verse 29. And the background is told in verses 17 to 20. So this is a flashback to what's happened previously. So verse 17, Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had now married. Because John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And so Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, but he liked to listen to him. So what's happening is that Herod respects John the Baptist. Herod likes to listen to John the Baptist, but his wife Herodias has been put off by John the Baptist teaching repentance. And so she waits her opportunity and eventually it comes and the lust of Herod and his guests after this uh, awful dance by this girl and Herod then makes a, a rash promise doesn't he Herod says uh, you can have whatever you like even up to half my kingdom verse 23 now it's worth remembering of course that Herod simply couldn't keep that promise the offer is massively ironic. He couldn't give his kingdom away because he didn't have the right to do that. Herod ruled under Roman authority. The contrast later, and the contrast even here, is with Jesus who gives kingdom power to the twelve to go and bring healing to many. Herod offers up half of his pitiful little kingdom, and the result is death for one of God's prophets. Choose your king is what Mark is saying to you and to I, just as to his first readers. So Herod likes to listen to John the Baptist, but he wouldn't repent of marrying his brother's wife. Eventually, his lust and his pride get the better of him. He makes a rash promise, and you know the rest of the story. The girl goes to ask her mother, what shall I ask for? Ask for the head of John the Baptist. And so Herodias gets John the Baptist executed, just as she'd been plotting to do all along. And Herod is sad, but he's not in control. He's not in control of his own kingdom. Now, the purpose of this story, I think, for Mark, is not only in the big picture of Mark chapter 6 to say, look at these two different kings, but the purpose is for us to have a warning from the life of Herod. 
And the warning is that we all need to repent to be part of Jesus' kingdom. And the way we know that is because that's the headline right at the start of Mark's gospel. Remember back to Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. After John the Baptist, there's the link, was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. What is it about John the Baptist preaching that has wound up Herodias in chapter 6, verses 17 to 20? It's the fact that he's been teaching Herod to repent. You shouldn't be married to your brother's wife. And it's that very fact that Herod hasn't repented that has caused all these problems. You see, Herod liked hearing John the Baptist speak. Herod didn't plan to end up murdering John the Baptist. The problem is that Herod didn't repent and he tried to sit on the fence. He tried to sit on the fence. But when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to eternity, there is no fence. We see that in verses 6 to 12 and 13, don't we? Just before this account of Herod's feast, you've got homes that either welcome the disciples or don't. Either they're welcomed and blessed, or the dust is shaken off their feet. There's no fence, there's no middle way, there's no Jesus is a good man, mad, bad or God. We thought about that a couple of weeks ago. Interestingly for Herod, what stopped him repenting was a sinful relationship. And how often is that true in these generations across churches around the world? It's a sinful relationship. Many of us, you see, we're happy to repent in general, but there are specific things we don't want to repent of. There's a warning, isn't there? That Herod didn't intend to kill John the Baptist, and he did enjoy listening to John the Baptist. He just didn't repent. And in fact, when we read on in Mark's Gospel, we'll see that what you get towards the end of this account is echoed later on. Verse 19, verse 21, you've got Herodias biding her time, just as the chief priests and the scribes want Jesus dead and wait for their chance. You've got Pilate giving in to pressure, just as Herod here gives in to pressure. And that's why Jesus is eventually killed, because Pilate gives in to that pressure. And you've got Joseph of Arimathea taking Jesus' body and laying it in the tomb, just as verse 29, some of John's disciples here take John the Baptist's body and lay it in the tomb, verse 19 and 21, verse 26, verse 29, all point forward to the tragedy of Jesus' death and crucifixion, which of, after all is why Jesus has come. It's what Mark's gospel is working up towards. So the warning here is don't be taken in by grotty kings in grotty kingdoms and do repent. There's no fence and not repenting might lead to us having these Herod moments, which would be awful. But then we turn to the second king. These two kings with their two kingdoms and their two feasts, King one Herod, King two Jesus. And look at his feast. It's a beautiful feast, a stunning provision from a king who's totally in charge. The contrast couldn't be greater, could it? The very famous feeding of the 5,000. And there's lots going on here. Uh, for example, you've got a miracle that is absolutely flat out impossible to fake. Jesus um, has got access to how many loaves? Go and see, verse 38. They found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. So Jesus takes five things the size of one of your fists and he makes it into enough bread to feed 5,000 people. Imagine a, a loaf of sliced bread of Hovis. And imagine all the loaves of Hovis that you would need to feed 5,000 people laid end to end. Jesus takes five loaves the size of yours and my fists and he makes it into a kilometer of Hovis bread. It's a miracle you couldn't fake. And there's lots and lots of Old Testament images 
in this passage, and that's no accident. You might have noticed them, verse 31, verse 32, verse 35. Three times Mark emphasizes this is a desert place. And what's Jesus doing in the desert place? Verse 34, he's teaching. And not just teaching, but he's feeding his people with bread. And he even looks up to heaven so that they're really clear where the power comes from. Following on from desert and teaching, you get a miraculous water crossing, even at the same time of day as the crossing of the Red Sea. And when Jesus catches up to the disciples in a boat, he says, I am, it is I. Or, or very similar to the Old Testament, I am, Yahweh. Lots and lots and lots of Exodus imagery here. And in fact, lots of wider Old Testament imagery too. Verse 34, the shepherd maybe points to Moses who shepherded God's people out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, maybe to Ezekiel 34, to Isaiah 40, to 2 Kings 4, and so on and so on and so on. The whole point here is that even though Jesus has been teaching in all these Jewish contexts, we'll see more about this next week, but Jesus has been teaching in all these Jewish contexts and has faced serious rejection, yet he is the one that fulfills the Old Testament. He is the one that fulfills the Exodus. He is the great shepherd that was looked forward to. And if you combine all these things, you not only have great proof that Jesus really is God's only chosen king, but it's a reminder that Jesus hasn't come to do a whole series of mini rescues to heal people and so on, but that Jesus has come to do the great big rescue. Jesus come to do the second Exodus, the new Exodus. You see, Jesus is proved to be the king. He's proved to be beautifully providing for his people, stunningly powerful, totally in charge, fulfilling all those ancient prophecies. And he's doing that to execute the new Exodus, the new great saving of God's people from slavery into freedom. Jesus will do that at the cross when he dies and he frees us from slavery to sin. And that's why you get all these Old Testament um, hints and echoes going on in this verse. But notice again the issue about repentance because the way the disciples react is surprising. Verse 50, immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves and their hearts were hardened. It's a reminder, isn't it, that that warning earlier of that need to repent is not just a warning that comes to those of us who perhaps wouldn't want to call ourselves Christians. That warning about fences and the need to not sit on them doesn't just come to those of us listening in to think these things through. Jesus' disciples had hardened hearts and hadn't understood that Jesus was God teaching and providing for his people in the wilderness, just as God had done in the Exodus with manna from heaven and teaching at Sinai. And that's the warning echoed again, twice in this passage, the warning. Repent, don't harden your heart. But there's a great encouragement, isn't there, as we close. Jesus has proved to be king yet again, an undeniable miracle. But what sort of king is Jesus? And what sort of kingdom is Jesus' kingdom? It's not a grotty kingdom of lust and failed promises. It's a kingdom where the king provides for his people. It's a kingdom where the king saves his people. A couple of times in the last week, I've been in conversations with people in our parish who've been reminding me of the personal cost it is to them to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. On at least two occasions this week, I, I've simply not known what to say as people have been sharing with me the cost of how hard it is to be a Christian. And they're inspiring and humbling stories. A great reminder to me as I pray for people. But what does Mark 6 say to them? What does Mark 6 say to us when we're finding it hard to be Christians, when the cost is high? Look at the king. 
look at the kingdom. What a beautiful kingdom. What glorious provision, not just proved to be king, but a wonderful king who provides for his people, who knows the cost it is to follow him, but he provides and he saves because Jesus is going to do the great exodus. He's going to achieve the great once for all, capital R, rescue of God's people. That's my king. Let's pray together. Father God in heaven, we praise you that Jesus is the king with full authority and full power, nothing like King Herod. And we praise you that Jesus' kingdom is a place of provision and safety, a place of rescue, of salvation. Thank you that Jesus provides for and saves his people. And we pray, Father, that you'll help each of us uh, to never sit on the fence, because there is no eternal fence. Protect us, please, from being like Herod and Help us to fully repent of everything that we need to repent of. And help us to fully trust in this glorious King and be encouraged at the way that Jesus provides for his people. We pray that in Jesus' own name. Amen. That marks the end of our formal time together. But please do take this opportunity just to write down something that God has said to you through his word this morning. Uh, maybe to Talk to someone you're sitting with, drop a text, pick up the phone, send a letter, write an email. Do whatever you can to help the truth of the Bible uh, stick in your heart and mind and life for today and onwards into the coming week. That will not only help you, but that will encourage other people too.